Hello and welcome to the group room where we're at the 34th annual CTRC AACR San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Very happy to be joined again this year by Dr. Clifford Huddis, Chief of the Breast Cancer Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. Hello, Dr. Huddis. Hello. Let's talk about what's new with chemotherapy trials. You gave a poster session discussing all of this, and there's a lot to talk about. There are. There are. This morning, uh, in our poster discussion session, we reviewed eight posters uh, that were presented in the earlier poster display session. And these posters had in common that they were explorations of various chemotherapy-related questions, although not 100% exclusively that. And they all represent, in my opinion, small or medium-sized tweaks in information that we already had. Some of them were studies we had seen before that had been updated. Uh, working through them this morning, uh, we started with a, um, a, a Japanese study that has been previously presented in which patients with uh, early stage breast cancer were randomly assigned to get AC or not, so that's the big anthracycline question right now. And after that, uh, or with or without that, they also were randomized for a taxane. And the taxane was either uh, Paclitaxel or Docetaxel, and both of them were given at three-week intervals. So this study was really a hot study when it was first launched because A, the role of anthracyclines remains very controversial, and B, the battle of the taxanes was ongoing. Uh, but what's interesting is to see how things have changed. First of all, they really didn't have sufficient power to rule out what could be a clinically meaningful benefit for anthracyclines, and we've seen other studies that have looked at that. And the second issue is they clearly show an advantage for docetaxel, which is at this point expected. Uh, the problem for clinicians and patients is the schedule of paclitaxel they used is basically never used. In fact, I asked the audience for a show of hands who uses every third week paclitaxel, and not one hand in a room of probably 500 people went up. This was limited to, to, to Japan? They did the study in Japan, uh, and they acknowledged, by the way, this limitation. It wasn't a gotcha moment. They, uh, they, they agree and they know that weekly paclitaxel really consistently seems to come out on top in almost every comparison. Uh, and since it's a generic drug, it's inexpensive uh, and widely available um, in, in most places right now, that's kind of the gold standard. So the missed opportunity here is to actually look at that. But nonetheless, the, the anthracycline question is of interest. and. Um, I think that, that we're going to, to use this as part of a, of a sort of a canvas of studies over the years to come to really try to answer it. Interestingly enough, another point that they made is that they, of course, didn't use trastuzumab. That's how old the study was. It's from before the era of trastuzumab, and 20% of their patients had HER2 positive disease, but they had not yet performed the kind of molecular subsetting that, that we need to, to look at those questions. And when you look at studies that come from other parts of the world, and, and, and as we understand more about environmental exposures and the biology of cancers, do you think there's any differences based on the region that you come from, in this case, Japanese women and their own cancer biology versus other parts of the world? Well, I'm probably a little bit of, um, of a, a naysayer here, but uh, at this very meeting, the IOM report was discussed, and there really is no evidence that the environment plays a major role in the way that lay people think in cancer. It's disturbing and frustrating that this is mm -hmm. true because everybody's looking for a, a scapegoat, but the things that people point to in the environment flat out don't seem to matter, and certainly if they do matter, they don't matter a lot. That said, there can be biological differences in regions of the world. There are different profiles in terms of the amounts of different kinds of cancer, triple negative cancer being more prevalent in some places than others. And dietary influences aren't excluded as a mm -hmm. possibility. But all of that aside, the truth is their patient population didn't look any different from other Western populations, as far as we could tell. A second one that, that I think is of some relation to that indirectly was from Steve Jones. He presented um, a study of TC, which is now one of the most popular adjuvant regimens out there. This is, again, docetaxel and cyclophosphamide. Uh, but what they did here is in a non-randomized study involving more than 400 women, they gave trastuzumab along with it. So they assumed that you don't need the anthracycline. They assumed that four cycles of TC would be sufficient, and they simply piloted for safety trastuzumab. And this raises an always contentious uh, question for all of us. Is that sufficient evidence to adopt it? Uh, 
It's interesting because many clinicians actually have. Some clinicians, unfortunately, are even a little bit confused. They say TCH, and they actually stuck cyclophosphamide in instead of the published carbo. So we were very clear about that. He takes a great pains to, pour, to point out that they're calling their regimen um, her TC. <laughs> just to, to be really clear, right. because the shorthand can confuse even you know busy clinicians, and, and I see it all the time. So that was a nice thing to see. Cardiac safety was, as expected, uh, clearly demonstrated. Uh, what's unfortunately not yet there is comparative efficacy or safety data to other uh, regimens. For example, weekly paclitaxel and trastuzumab has been tested, but not yet reported in a very similar study from uh, Dana-Farber and colleagues. There was a, a third study I'll just mention in that set, which was a sequence of epirubicin cyclophosphamide and docetaxel as compared to um, uh, FEC 120, which is a high-dose epirubicin regimen. Uh, they looked equivalent for efficacy, but the toxicity of the more cycles of epirubicin were just as expected and kind of forbidding. And again, hearing about drugs that have been around for mm -hmm. such a long time, it seems unusual in this new era of evolving targeted therapies, sort of talking about some of these older chemotherapy agents. Well, that's, your, your concern is matched by the fact that they, they aren't just older agents, they're older trials. These are often second, third, fourth reports of previously reported studies. So they're just giving us longer-term follow-up from these studies. And, I see. Uh, you know, th at the same time that people are very dismissive in a way of the, of the chemotherapy trials, the truth is that they are broadly applicable. They have a tremendous immediate impact in many cases on how women are treated the day after the meeting. The drugs are much less expensive than any of the targeted therapies, so uh, it's sort of, you know, popular to be dismissive of this uh, right now, but, but they're actually pretty important studies from a broad public health point of view. But there was one um, looking at bevacizumab specifically in the uh, preoperative setting. Harry Baer presented this. It's an, a previously presented um, NSABP study. And the primary goal of the study was to ask whether three different chemo regimens were the same or different pre-op. It was paclitaxel alone with capecitabine or with gemcitabine. That result's previously been shown negative. A second randomization asked about bevacizumab or not. And um, that efficacy data was presented also at um, ASCO last year. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because it made for an interesting discussion. Uh, while the reason they showed it at this meeting was to look specifically at surgical complications. There have been concerns that bevacizumab would affect wound healing, and there's been a reported high rate of implant uh, failure in patients who have breast reconstruction. And Harry uh, basically showed that there is a higher rate, although it could still be deemed acceptable across the board for various things. But the interesting part of that discussion was to go back to their efficacy data. So what they showed was that the study overall was positive for BEV in terms of pathologic CR in the breast complete response rate, and that the signal was most striking in the ER positives. So that gave me an opportunity to turn to, to another presenter, uh, Gunter von Minkowitz, who was on the panel. He was on the panel for a different study, but at ASCO last year, he demonstrated that uh, adding bevacizumab was not useful in a virtually the same design study. And moreover, if there was a subset with a benefit, it was triple negative. So it made for a little point-counterpoint. Here you have two pre-op studies. They both test the addition of bevacizumab. One says it's useful and really useful in ER positives. The other says it's negative, but if it's useful, it's in triple negative. How does anybody make sense of such two observations, right? They're completely at odds. There are two others that I think are of, of real importance, and, and one especially provocative. So the Germans have been looking at various kinds of dose-dense chemotherapy for high-risk breast cancer for years. And they tagged on to several of their studies, including one that we discussed this morning, a flat-out randomization for darbopoietin, the red blood cell boosting drug. So you may or may not remember that this drug is used to treat anemia, often associated with chronic kidney disease, and it's used to treat anemia associated with chemotherapy. Um, more than a decade ago, as it was first being developed, or at least drugs in this class, there was a suspicion that they would improve quality of life by keeping hemoglobin up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They would avoid transfusion. That was something that could be quantified. But then came a sort of dark period. There's actually a black box warning on these drugs. They are not to be given to patients who are getting curative chemotherapy for cancer. And the reason for that is that there was an observation of an increased risk of death in some studies. So what these investigators have done now in two different trials, including one we discussed today, is 
suggest as much as you can that there's no detriment to using these drugs in patients being cured. I say that because the studies aren't huge. You know, to rule out a small negative, you would need a massive trial. Okay. And so they gave patients myelosuppressive chemotherapy. They randomized them for Darbo, Putin. They demonstrated that hemoglobin stayed much higher. Uh, the audience pretty much agreed that that's a surrogate for quality of life. A higher mm -hmm. hemoglobin generally mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. exercise tolerance and mm -hmm. so on. And then they showed that the... Um, uh, there was no difference whatsoever in uh, overall outcomes, both for di for disease for your overall survival. So I mean, that's interesting. So I actually put the black box warning up, and I challenged the audience to to think about whether the warning is really uh, completely evidence based at this point. And there's no weird answer, but but the evidence that exists in this setting actually suggests that it might not be risky. This is prospective randomized data. This isn't retrospective dredging of studies in other settings. So I, I think it's a provocative uh, issue and, and, and it, it engendered a lot of, of discussion. The only other abstract I would just make mention of was a randomized trial that you might think has been done before, and it has, but this happened to be another group, a Spanish group, Lepatinib versus Trastuzumab. Mm -hmm. The background is everybody was getting EC uh, Paclitaxel. And once again, as has been reported in other settings, the use of lopatinib as compared to the use of just trastuzumab was, was associated with a slightly inferior outcome. One of the areas that we always talk about with you that you're really focused on is, are the chemotherapeutic agents, which still seem to be the cornerstone of, I guess, breast cancer treatment and many other cancers. And um, earlier we did speak about aribulin, mm -hmm. which is one of the newer chemotherapy mm -hmm. additions to uh, breast cancer treatment as in the metastatic setting. And I'm just wondering, you know, and I have asked this question before of some other doctors because at ASCO it was suggested that this might be the really, for a long time, the last major chemotherapy new compound. Where are we going with chemotherapy and breast cancer now with all of these targeted agents um, hitting the scene? So, so I think it's important probably to start to realize what we're doing is pulling out groups of patients with breast cancer for different approaches. We've done it for years with hormone therapy, and we've done it more recently for HER2 positive disease. The problem that one has to acknowledge is several things. First of all, um, in, re in very few settings right now do those targeted therapies eliminate or even reduce the use of chemotherapy. They're simply add-ons either to existing chemo or instead of one chapter of chemotherapy. For example, if you give HER2-based therapy right now, you're not replacing chemotherapy. You're just giving it with chemo, and almost every positive example, including the Cleopatra study that you've discussed elsewhere, it's still built on a backbone of, pa uh, of docetaxel right. in that case. So we can't lose sight of that. And, and because of the negative effects of chemotherapy, by the way, the quality of life impact, one needs to pay attention to it so that we don't make things worse for people, too. Patients who get have horm hormone-sensitive disease ultimately, in most cases, if it's metastatic, become refractory. So I'm making the point that we can delay chemotherapy more than we used to. We can forestall its use. We can be smarter about its use. But people benefit from chemotherapy, and our responsibility is to do it in the way that's best for them. That's the goal. You know, Dr. Huddison, in speaking with many of the, um, the advocates, especially advocates that are dealing with advanced disease, and you had just mentioned selectively, you know, maybe pulling out patients, we've been doing a lot of uh, work in the area of, of rare cancers, and from a clinician's point of view, it seems to me that even amongst the most common cancers, and in this case breast cancer, that there are these subgroups that actually, what feels to me to be, gee, these look like rare cancers amidst the more common cancers. Is there clinical validity to what feels very obvious to many of us as advocates? I think the answer is absolutely yes. And, and for a perfect example, look at lung cancer last year, where an early phase study of crizatinib was essentially made positive because they stumbled on mm -hmm. to some activity in a group of people they didn't even know existed, people with an AML4 ALK translocation. Well, mm -hmm. this is what I think is potentially happening in breast cancer. But at the same time, 
one thing to bear in mind is that that isn't maybe uh, going to be quite as revolutionary in the long term as people think, because right now you're limited by the availability of the targets and the availability of the targeted agents. So even with that kind of a breakthrough, you may get one line of therapy out of your exciting new treatment, but regrettably maybe, after that, functionally you're just back to chemotherapy treatment and breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Clifford Huddis, Chief of the Breast Cancer Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.